Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our estate planning webinar today on organizing your information in one place. My name is Graham Christofferson. I'm an estate and trust associate at Boulay, and I'll be assisting my colleague and today's presenter, Andrea Thermos, during this webinar. Before we begin, I'd like to mention a few housekeeping items. First, you'll notice a link to our interactive Survivor's Roadmap Guide in the chat box. If you haven't already downloaded it or printed that out, please do so now so you can reference it and or fill it out during today's presentation. Please also note the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Please feel free to ask questions using that box throughout the webinar, and we'll do our best to answer all of your questions. Please note that this webinar will be recorded and a link to watch the recording will be sent to you in a follow-up email. Now I'd like to introduce Andrea Thermis. Andrea joined Boulay's Estate and Trust Department in 2012, and she was recently promoted to Senior Manager. She specializes in trust, gift, and estate tax compliance, planning for death and post-death asset management, and trust funding. Andrea, provi Andrea provides audit defense for state and federal estate taxes, and she's responsible for the supervision and development of a state and trust tax staff. Andrea has a passion for assisting those dealing with the death of a loved one, and she understands that it is something most people deal with only once or twice in their lifetime. Thank you for joining, and I will now turn it over to Andrea. Graham, thank you for that. Welcome, everybody. Um, bear with me. This is my first time presenting via Zoom, and I look forward to sharing information with you today um, to give you a piece of background for myself. I have specialized in the state and trust, as Graham mentioned, for, for a number of years, about 20 years. I have been in public accounting, and for most of that, I have done a state and trust. Um, I look forward to sharing this information with you today. And we are going to have, so this is an overview of the whole guide. Um, in, in future months, December, January, and February, we're going to have more in-depth looks if you would like to join us at those times. Um, Future emails will be coming out about those, those items, and um, I hope you can join us for a deeper dive into this information. So let's get going. Today I'm gonna to go over considerations of, of planning beyond your will. We're gonna look at legacy letters. We're gonna look at the survivor's checklist, guidance for minor children, guidance for your pets and digital and online accounts. So in my experience, uh, many marriages, with many marriages, one spouse takes on the management of a, a couple's finances. Sometimes it's because the other spouse has no interest or no understanding of investing taxes and other money topics. This arrangement can be disastrous when the financially minded spouse dies. Um, if you believe you've done everything to plan for your passing, um, you've done, you, you know, you believe you've done everything. You've done your will, you've done your trust, you've done your health care directive, you've probably possibly made your funeral arrangements, um, but all the planning in the world can't necessarily address all the things that you need to when that loved one passes away. Um, they know where to access things, they know how to find things, they know where to look for their online accounts, for instance. Uh, today, I'm going to walk you through some considerations about things beyond the legal documents, things that will possibly help your survivors get through the tough, toughest time of their life. If you're leaving behind a loved one, a spouse, um, you know, if you're leaving behind your spouse, you may believe that they understand how to locate all of your information. Um, but consider a spouse who's uncomfortable with the computer and all of the banking and investing done through online accounts. Do you want your spouse to be faced with, the, with making major decisions and not being able to access the information they need? I have had many instances in which the surviving spouse does not even know if they have enough money to survive through the end of the year. Um, it's a sad position for me to, to help them through, but oftentimes I'm in a position to reassure them that they absolutely have the finances available and everything will turn out well for them in the end. Um, an additional thing that I face often is when a child is managing a parent's estate. 
um, maybe it's the second parent to die. And in some cases, the parents have been really kind of closed, vested about where their things are, what things they have, and the, that child doesn't even know where to begin. So taking some time to fill in this roadmap, it can guide people you trust through the most stressful decisions and provide answers they, they need um, when, when you've left everything in one place. Um, having this guide from you will help them carry out your plans and settle your affairs. So where do you start? First of all, let them know where to find your instructions or give them a copy of your roadmap. Store it in an easy to access place, not in a safe deposit box because that is not easy to access. Um, but have it somewhere in your home where they're aware of it or give them a copy. This guide is available both digitally and you can print it and fill it in, whichever is easiest for you. Um, you know, the further removed that your personal representatives, representative is of your estate, the harder it is for them to administer things efficiently. A spouse will often know where to find information. Your child is gonna be comfortable going through your things, but imagine, if you will, um, having a cousin or a close friend administering your estate. While they're familiar with your home, they may not be comfortable going through your belongings and, and through things on your behalf. So just planning for that, will just give guidance to that person unbelievable amount of, um, an un, un, excuse me, an unbelievable amount of guidance. Um, several years ago, I had the pleasure of working with, with a woman um, who was the personal representative of her cousin's estate. That, that the client of mine lived here in Minnesota and the cousin lived in Texas. She said yes to her cousin, not actually realizing the full extent of the responsibility of administering a state and the difficulties that she might face being so many states away. Um, after one of our calls, uh, I, I asked her, you know, I said, would, would you have said yes if you had known all that you knew, all that you know now about what it would take to administer a state? I also asked her to share, me, share with me some insights um, for me to pass along. She wishes she had had the following. She wishes she had a list of who to contact, the friends who were important to her cousin, and to let them know of the passing. She wishes she had known where all the important documents were kept, things such as her birth certificate, her social security card, her recent taxes, copies of her will and trust documents, and who to contact for those documents. She wishes there had been a, a handwritten list of who gets what in the house full of stuff and what was important and what could be donated. And finally, the most important thing I think is she wishes she had had a list of her username and passwords for her digital and online accounts. You know, you hear that often, digital and online accounts. And you think, oh, my bank account and my, you know, my investment account and my retirement accounts. Well, how about your social media accounts? Who has the right to have access to those? Who, who would even think of that? Um, later on, we will, we will kind of discuss some more digital and online information. So for this client, in the months following her cousin's death, she made countless trips to Texas to settle her cousin's affairs and manage the assets that were in Texas. The client felt like a part of her life had to be put on hold while she managed this process and wishes she had been more informed about what it would take to finalize an estate. So before I move on, Graham, are there any questions? Uh, there does not appear to be any yet. Okay, thank you. Oh, sorry, uh, we actually just had our first one come in. Okay. So it says, uh, in regards to where you store your docs, do you have any thoughts on filing your will with the county if you are a divorced parent that has a divorce decree slash parenting time agreement? Um, I don't know that there's a need to, 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 I don't know that there's actually a way to file your will with the county prior to your death. 
I know that it happens as part of a probate process. Um, I would give it to a trusted friend or advisor, uh, maybe the person who, if you have minor children, I would, I would provide a copy of your will to that person who is going to be um, the, the guardian to those minor children so that they have a copy of it and, they're, and fill them in about how they should um, manage that process if you were to pass away. Anything else, Graham? I know that appears to be the only one at this time. Okay, so um, as Graham mentioned, there was a there's a guide that was sent both with with um, your online registration and also in, included in the the question and answer box. If you have downloaded that, I'm the rest of the presentation is going to follow that guide, and I will reference the pages in that. Um, Raise your hand or push a question out to Graham and he will let me know if you're um, having difficulties following that along with that. So I'm going to start with page three of the guide. Um, and, it, and it discusses legacy letters. The interesting thing about legacy letters, you know, they share important life stories, life lessons. Maybe it gives advice to minor children. It gives your personal history and it, it can be a written record of your origins or family, family information. Um, while your will is an important piece of your estate planning, it doesn't share your story. It can't give advice to your children or grandchildren. It can't relay a family tradition. And taking the time to write a letter or write that information down will be invaluable to the people who, who survive you. My, my father's parents were both from Greece. Um, they arrived in the United States separately. Uh, my, my, father, my grandfather is a young man of about 15 or 16, and my grandmother is a child. She was probably five or six when she arrived in the US. Um, I know very, very, very little about my grandfather. Um, what I have been able to find, I have found on Ancestry. He, he arrived through Ellis Island and lived in Chicago. Um, that's about as much as I know about his beginnings. Um, from what I can find, he, he was here with his father. Um, my grandmother and her family settled in the Milwaukee area. Um, I know that I have distant relatives that are still in the Milwaukee area, but I know very little about their beginnings. I know, um, I, don't know how they, I don't know how they met. I don't know how they fell in love. I don't know how they ended up in Red Wing. Um, well, I didn't know. I recently found out from my mother um, that, that they owned a restaurant in Red Wing that, that um, my grandmother's sister and her husband had been running and wanted to move back to Milwaukee. So they convinced my grandparents to, to move to Red Wing and settle there. Um, I wish I had known more about their history. I, I wish I knew more about their, their, their time in Greece. Um, you know, it's all lost. I don't, I don't know much about the restaurant they had in Red Wing. Um, I know the building it was in. I know where, you know, wh where it occupies. It's actually still a restaurant, ironically. Um, in the in-between years from when my grandparents had the restaurant and the new restaurant that's there now, there was a Sears outlet store there. So, I wish I had known more about their story. I wish there was something written down about it. Um, it, it just reminds me of the importance of sharing that information with, with your loved ones. Um, I have another silly antidote I, I heard a long time ago that um, kind of explains a tradition. Um, it, it, it's kind of a tongue in cheek uh, story. So, uh, uh, Years ago, you could buy ham in a can. And for a family dinner, um, the spouse would always cut the ends of the ham off to cook it. And the husband inquired, you know, why, why do you do that? And sh she told him, well, it's the way my mother always did it. Okay, well, that's a tradition of some sort, apparently. And he just, uh, just nodded his head and said, okay. Um, a few months later, when the family had gathered, 
and the husband was with his mother-in-law and she was again preparing ham. Uh, he, he asked about the tradition. Why, why did she always cut the pan off, or cut the, the ends of the ham off? And her very simple response was, because the pan it needed to fit in, I needed to cut the ends off the ham. So it, 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 it's a silly story, a silly anecdote, but it gives you an idea of had he not had his mother-in-law present to ask that question, he would have always wondered, why do we cut the, the ends off the ham? Um, so it, it just gives a really, that's a silly example, but it, it can kind of um, drive home what, what, why traditions are important and what, what is silly to one person might be poignant to the member of the family who is, who's part of it. Um, you know, each family has their own traditions. Everybody has their mementos, um, old photographs, and sometimes it can be a joy to know their origins. So I think that's all I have about legacy letters. Um, Graham, I can see that some questions have come in. Do they relate to that or something else? Um, so we have two. Uh, the first one kind of just asked, do you have any tips uh, relating to having these discussions with family members? Would you like to hear this? Uh, um, so a number of years ago, uh, I, I'll, um, me, along with a cousin of mine, we had the opportunity to, to, to get our mothers together and another aunt. And um, we, we had a pile of family pictures and we used that as a way of introducing, hey, let's go through these pictures so that we can identify who's in them. We'll know who's in them, but you can tell us the stories about them. So if you have a way of asking questions and um, I, I have found even people who aren't relatives, people like to talk about themselves. So if, if you have a family member who you are just curious about their history, ask if you can, you know, have dinner with them or visit with them, you know, right now via Zoom. Um, but asking, just basically asking the question. Um, as far as more delicate matters, like an estate plan, um, Sometimes you just have to be bold. Um, I know that the generation that my mother is in, um, she's 80 and she pretty much still is as her, you know, mid 50s year old daughter. I am told often it's none of your business. Uh, I, I stand my ground and just ask her gently or not so gently sometimes. Mom, I'm, you know, I'm the personal representative of your estate. I need to understand some of this stuff. So, so sometimes you have to dig your own heels in and, and um, just ask the questions. But if you want to have a legacy conversation, I think it's important that they understand that you really want to hear their story and you want to know their history. Okay. Well said. Um, so we have another question uh, in reference to kind of like the sensitive information that may need to be given to appropriate people. Um, someone's asking, how would you suggest protecting that information from unauthor unauthorized people? Uh, they give an example, uh, someone who may break into your house looking for precisely those things or that information. Um, I, I, are, are we talking about, so, um, I'm going to assume that this question has to do with, with account numbers and um, personal, really personal data like your social security card and such. Um, so if, 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 and I'm gonna get into the minor children and handling that information if you have minor children. Um, if we're talking about a will, um, I don't know that anybody would break into a home to, to steal a will necessarily unless there's a family strife somehow. Um, as far as social security documents and um, passports, things like that, they should be in a secure place in your home. Um, while a lockbox is a good thing, a, a lot of people don't use them appropriately and they can be carried off. Um, I, I don't have necessarily a good place for them. I, my own is stored in a, 
my my social security cards and my my own passport are stored in a in a in a drawer but not in a drawer where you would think they would be stored so it's kind of finding your own home in your own home um i have seen people store things in the freezer but thieves know that um so i think it's knowing your own home and where you're comfortable directing that person to that information um, i don't know that you necessarily have to give copies of those things to the person who's your personal representative, but they should know where to access them in your own home. Thank you. Answered the question. For sure. No, thank you for your insight. Uh, it appears to be all the questions for right now. Okay. So now in the guide, I'm moving on to uh, pages four through twelve. Um, so page four is a is a checklist of items to address prior to death. Um, the, the, there are items that you should note and give your guidance to, um, reminders for things that are currently in your life that you can manage on an ongoing basis or when you have had a change of circumstances in your life. So, um, stupid me, I didn't print the guide myself, so I don't have it right in front of me, but from memory, I know that the, the guide talks about um, beneficiaries and beneficiary designations. And when I say changes in life circumstances, um, divorce is, is more common than not. And changing beneficiaries is something that's sometimes overlooked and can cause problems. Um, if you have life insurance in particular or retirement accounts, those are some of the first things that you should consider making changes to. And if you haven't done them at this point and have gone through a divorce, um, you should update that information. Uh, we worked on an estate um, in 2017 and the decedent was at the time, at the time of his death was single. Um, he had been through a recent divorce that he had two children from that marriage, but he had a prior marriage, um, his first marriage, occurred in the 80s and the divorce also occurred in the 80s. And he, at the time that they divorced, he had a small IRA account and had neglected to, to update the beneficiary designation on that. So when he passed away in 2017, even though he had been divorced from that spouse for almost 30 years, she was the name beneficiary and it ended up in a court proceeding so that the children that, that survived um, who were his his rightful beneficiaries did indeed get get that account but they had to go through a court process so being mindful of making those changes and um updating that information is really important um it's also important for um people in your life to know that 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 stuff has occurred um sorry to cut you off andrea um that's okay we may be having some issues uh, involving the slides. Could you double check oh, and make sure that- uh, I'm sorry. Uh, Thank no you. problem at all. Yeah. I forgot about them. <laughs> no problem. See, new new presenter. So thank you for that. Um, so the checklist. Page five begins with initial tasks. Um, it reminds your survivors where to find the list and who to alert. Um, the checklist talks about immediate tasks, tasks within the first month, and tasks beyond the first month. It will note location of important documents and what your final wishes are. So on page five, the initial tasks, it reminds your survivors of where to find a list of who to alert. Those who you want to alert could be close friends. It could be your attorney, your accountant, your financial advisor. Um, maybe you have estranged children that should be notified, things like that. Um, it will give immediate information to caregivers for your children or your pets. And it maybe will tell, will, will tell your survivor or your personal representative if you, have, if you have a prepaid memorial service for a celebration of your life. Page six is a continuation of the tasks. Um, that does include who your professional service providers are, such as your attorney, investment advisor, or your accountant. 
It reminds your survivors to secure your home if it will be left unattended and to have your mail forwarded. The importance of that, um, you unfortunately there can be unscrupulous family members who will go into a home and take assets that they believe they're entitled to. Um, it also, if, if you're in a area where maybe thieves are following obituaries, they might know that a house is empty and there can be unfortunate circumstances surrounding that. Um, this list can also provide who your utility services are if you have a newspaper delivered. Um, that's another item that, that is noted is if you have newspapers piling up in your driveway or the lawn isn't mowed, um, those are things that people are looking for easy, easy prey will, will use. Pages seven, eight, and nine are suggested tasks to complete within the first month. They include notification of life insurance policies and to begin the claim process. Something to be aware of when you do life insurance is if you know that the estate is gonna have um, an estate tax return filing requirement, there's a form you have to request from the insurance company. Um, uh, other things in that first month include contacting Social Security Administration and other retirement account pays of the death, accessing the bank account, um, the decedent's bank accounts and stopping any automatic payments, canceling any automatic prescription refills, obtaining copies of outstanding bills like utilities, lines of credit, and medical costs. Um, Page eight has a pretty lengthy list of possible documents and account information that a personal representative may need to access. So in today's world, as many of us are aware of, um, a lot of us do things electronically and online. Um, I think we're, we're past the days where our personal representative can check our mail kind of regularly and get all of our bills and all of our invoices and all of the things that used to come in the mail I think with so many of us having moved to online bill pay and on you know automatic bill pay and things like that, it becomes more and more imperative that not only are they aware of who your utility providers are and who where your garbage pickup is done and all of that, that they actually have online access and know how to access your accounts. Um, moving on, um, page 10 offers suggestions for tasks to complete um, within two months, such as running a credit report, filing claims for final medical costs, contacting the DMV to cancel driver's license, and change title and registration. Um, why do you wanna monitor the credit report? Um, it can alert you to possible fraud. And again, unscrupulous people who are monitoring obituaries um, or people who have access to social security information can do things inappropriately with someone's name and social security number that they might get away with for a longer period of time than if somebody were alive. Um, a number of years ago, we worked on an estate uh, in which the decedent's final 1040 had not been filed. And when we went to file it, we were e-filing it and we got notification back from the IRS that the return had already been filed. So what happens in a case like that is the personal representative has to contact Social Security, or I'm sorry, the IRS, and determine what was filed. Um, it turns out in this case that um, this gentleman's social security number was being used inappropriately and somebody, somebody had filed a fraudulent tax return, getting a refund they weren't entitled to with information that they probably um, made up somehow. So not only would they be able to do the, the tax return, but they could have opened up um, credit cards and other items under that social, using that social security number. Um, so monitoring the credit reports and actually at this point locking them down can prevent some of those unscrupulous things from happening.
Um, I know I'm not changing slides, but I don't have slides for each of these sections. So um, I'll continue on, but I think that there's a question came in, so. I'm sure uh, this may be better suited for the end, but. Uh, uh, okay. Um, would you like to hear it now? It's uh, in reference to gift tax, gift tax returns, Form 79. Oh. Yeah, why don't we wait for that one? Sure, uh, we did have another one come in though. It says, uh, does it make sense that aging people put a credit lock while they are alive to prevent fraud? So, um, yes, I think that it's important that um, people such as my mother who, um, I, I call her a Luddite, and if you don't know what that means, you can Google it. Um, she absolutely refuses to have a cell phone. She refuses to have a computer. Um, when she had to do some stuff with her social security, they told her she had to do it online. Um, thankfully, I, I, was, I was with her at that time and I could help her with it and can help her with it now. Um, she wouldn't have any idea how to find her credit report online, um, much less lock it down, but yeah. I, she doesn't use her credit. She doesn't need anything. Um, so if somebody were to have access to her social security number, they could uh, uh, cause some pretty, pretty substantial problems for her unbeknownst to her because she's not checking that. So yes, it probably is a good idea to, because you can lock your credit reports at this point, and at least it prevents anybody from gaining credit under your social security number. Well said. Uh, other than that question, we can say for the end, that appears to be all right now. Okay. So moving on, um, I think I'm at page 10 of the guide. Um, so we, we were talking about credit reports. So absolutely running a credit report, but watching it. I mean, even watching it while you're alive is a good thing. Um, so contacting the DMV to cancel driver's license, it goes along with that, that identity theft fraud kind of stuff. That's why you want to do stuff like that. Um, shoot, I lost my train of thought. Oh, same thing with your vehicle registration. Just getting it up to date, either selling the car or um, moving into the name of the person if it's a surviving spouse, getting it listed so that it's only in their name um, helps move things forward for them. So page 11 lays out tasks that would be ongoing or completed during the year following death, such as filing the income tax return, the estate return, and following up with the decedent's personal service providers to settle the estate. Um, page 12. Page 12 offers planning opportunities for the survivor, such as adding or updating life insurance policies, Updating their own estate plan, their, you know, their will, their trusts, their health care directives, their power of attorney, um, and why those are listed and why that update is necessary is when a couple is married, they typically have what's called mirror documents, and what that means is my document is the same as my husband's document, except mine has my name and his has his name. Um, Mine will name him as my personal representative and his will name me as his personal representative. And your document does provide for, typically provides for a, a subsequent personal representative to, to be there. But if you update your documents, then they can be updated to follow current estate law and current um, state statutes for estates, if that makes sense. Um, the other thing is updating beneficiary designations. Um, I don't know how many estates that I have worked on that the person who passed away was the beneficiary of a retirement account for a parent of their own or an aunt or uncle. And when they pass away, that account becomes an asset of their estate and may push their estate into probate when maybe they had done planning not to have to have probate. So looking beyond just your own assets, what, what have you inherited and what, have you, what are you entitled to? And do those have current beneficiary designations? So those kinds of things are important. Um, page 13 is an interesting page to me. Um, 
It gives you space to fill out all of the pertinent information required for Minnesota death certificate. Um, Minnesota has a pretty, pretty straightforward death certificate. It's got the name of the decedent, their social security number, um, their place of birth. It provides who their parents were. Death certificates years ago used to provide a lot more information than that, but it, they don't now. Um, so for Minnesota, um, an example, if uh, back to my, my, my Texas cousin, um, she maybe wouldn't have readily known that information. She didn't have the social security number readily available. She didn't have the items needed to necessarily put on that death certificate. Um, in my case, my, my husband's parents were deceased before I ever met him. Um, he and I have been together for about 10 years. And while I know his parents' names, I don't know where they were born. I don't know very, I know very little about them just because they aren't part of our lives. Um, and if I had to provide that information for my husband's death certificate, I would be hard pressed to, to lay my hands on it immediately. Um, same for me with him. My father passed away years ago. And if he needed that information um, for my, my father's date of death, it would be hard pressed for him to provide that as well. So having that information on this form provides not only your spouse, but anybody else who would be doing your death certificate, um, it provides them with that information. Graham, I saw something come in. Is there a question on that before I move on to just the guidance items? Sure, we, we had one more. Uh, they ask, do you know, can you lock down elderly credit if they do have a current credit card? Um, so there, the, there's, a, there's two processes. So you can lock down your credit report, which prevents your credit, you know, from, which, which prevents people from getting credit cards under your, your, your name and social security number. The credit card companies themselves are specific to that credit card. I know um, for myself, when I use my online um, access now, when I have my phone and I'm using my, um, when I'm just looking at my account information, it does have a box now for me to just lock that card specifically. So I think it's a two different, locking down your credit is not the same as locking down the credit card. But yes, you could lock down that person's credit card as well so that if it's something they aren't using and they just have for emergency purposes, it would be really smart to probably do that. That's a really good question. Yeah, thank you for that insight. Uh, that appears to be all for now. Okay. So, so guidance. Um, you know, who, who are your key estate planning counselors? Um, are you providing for minor children? And do you have pets? Um, so, <clears throat> um, Somebody in the office, um, I'm just gonna talk about key estate planning counselors to start with. So somebody in the Boulay office, um, maybe about a year ago came and just, she said she had some questions for me. Um, she had an uncle who had recently passed away. He, for years and years and years, lived in Colorado and had maybe six months prior to his death, moved to Arizona. This uncle had been in a long-term relationship um, but was no longer in that relationship. And because of his move, nobody, including the person he had been in a long-term relationship with, knew who his current attorney was, where to find his current will, or had access to his current will. Um, when this staff person went to Arizona with her um, uncle's brother, so her other uncle, um, the the condo that he lived in, the people who, who managed the condo didn't want to give them access because they didn't have a document showing that they were um, allowed to have access to that, that, that condo, to that information. And pretty much what the answer, you know, that, that our staff person gave was, she said, we have to go in the condo. We, that's where the documents are that we need to access so that we can find the information that we need to 
administer his estate and, and move forward with this or else you're going to have an empty condo for quite a while. Um, they reluctantly gave access to one person um, to the condo. They were able to find a document. They don't know if it was the most recent document. It ends up being the document that they did use. Um, in the will that was quite old, it did list his former partner as the beneficiary, the complete beneficiary of his estate. And because of no one else knowing if there was anything else in place, um, they had to go with that. So that moral of that story is make sure that um, people know who your, um, maybe who your attorney is, where that information can be found, who your accountant is. That gets back to that list um, about page, I think, nine, eight, nine, or 10. Um, listing out who your key, key people are and where they can be contacted and, and where people can access that information. Minor children. Um, I am the, I'm the, I was for years the, the non-child non family member in my family. I have four siblings. Um, three of the four graciously named me as the guardian for their children. <laughs> I was in a position that I hoped that none of them had an unfortunate demise and that I would end up with a house full of kids that I wasn't expecting. Um, thankfully for me, um, the, the last, the, the two youngest turned 18 this past year. So I, I don't have that on my plate any longer. Um, but it, 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 it often gave me just, consideration, you know, if, if I had become a guardian for those children, I wouldn't have been prepared to be a parent immediate like that. Um, so not only would their world be disrupted, but so would mine. Um, I would have to learn the routines and the life of those children. And, you know, your will in your will, you will name a guardian for your children. And that's often why people um, who are young believe that they believe that's the only reason they need a will. And there are other reasons, but that's a good reason. And if that's what it takes to get them to have a will, great. Um, but this document will allow them to lay out written instructions. You know, in the case of my family, I, I have a, a solid understanding of, you know, their, moral, their morals, their religious views, things like that. But I would not have known my nieces and nephews' routines. I wouldn't have necessarily known their friend groups. I knew peripherally what their activities were, but I, I wouldn't have had any idea how to manage all of a sudden all those activities that they have. Um, so laying out guides for who your guardian will be, particularly if that named guardian is not a sibling of yours or your husband's. Um, you know, what, what, you know, it goes back to that legacy thing, but in this instance, you're laying out, what are, what are your hopes and dreams for your children? What do you want their education to look like? Um, what, are their, what are their routines currently? What are their friends like? Um, where would you like them to go to school? Where do you want them to go to college? Um, just, just helping them, helping the person who is the guardian know what your desires are will just, just be a blessing to them. Um, and the last note on this slide is, who should tell your children about your death? About, you know, about their parent passing? Um, I was 17 when my father passed away and I had three younger siblings, I had an older sibling and, and three younger siblings. And had my mom not been present, I know who would have been the person to tell us about that. Um, but who would you want to tell your children? You know, if the person who is your guardian isn't available, how, how, how would you, how would you, how would you want that handled? Who would you want to handle that? You know, do you want it to be a stranger telling them such a delicate piece of information? Or do you want it to be a close family member or, or friend? 
Um, so if you make your wishes known, it makes things a lot easier for those who survive you. Graham, is there a question specific yep. to that before I move on? Um, not to that specifically. Uh, there's okay. one more, but it might also be more suited for the end. Okay, we'll wait on it then. So, um, furry friends are as important to people as their children. Um, people who don't have children but have pets um, want their pets provided for as well. Um, just like with your children, you want written instructions. Unlike your children, your pets can't actually tell the person who's taking care of them now what their needs are and what's, you know, what's bothering them or what their routine is. So having that routine written down, having them kind of having it laid out, who's their veterinarian, you know, where do you, what dog parks, parks do you possibly visit? What, you know, what's their routine? What does their routine look like? Um, Minnesota, surprisingly, was the last state to pass legislation that allows for creation of trust to care for our pets. Um, so what the statute says is the trust may be created to provide for the care of an animal alive during the settler's lifetime, and the settler would be you. The trust terminates upon the death of the animal, or if the trust was created to provide the, for the care of more than one animal alive during the settler's lifetime, upon the death of the last surviving animal, the trust may not be enforced for more than 90 years. And you're probably thinking, well, 90 years is a long time for a pet. Um, I just saw an article. There are some breeds of turtles that can live for upwards of 150 to 200 years. So be wary of buying a turtle for your children. They may last longer than you think. <laughs> Digital estate plan. Um, this is one of my areas of passion. Um, I don't know how many survivors that I have, have had to help navigate, particularly the financial accounts of their surviving, you know, of, the, of their deceased spouse and access the information because um, once their death becomes known, those, those financial records get locked down. And um, so it's a timing thing and uh, uh, what's in the best interest of the survivor. Um, so cloud, the cloud, the cloud, the internet, it's made our lives easier, um, but it has made deaths more complex. Um, most of our physical possessions um, take on digital forms. Photographs, letters, bank statements, currency, a lot of things are done electronically. Um, in the past, we had physical possessions. You know, we had photo albums. We had um, pictures and things to pass on to people. Um, I I'm guessing, and Graham, you can correct me if I'm wrong, I'm guessing you don't have any printed pictures. I do not. <laughs> um, but how many digital pictures do you have? Hundreds. If, thousands. If, if not, maybe thousands, yes. Because you've been doing digital pictures since you were 15? Yeah, I'd say so. If I yeah. lost my cell phone, I'd be in a lot of trouble. A lot of luck. <laughs> so while, while we are a generation or we have a generation of people who are taking a lot more pictures than ever were taken in the past, they're not printed. So they're available in places like Instagram and Facebook and TikTok and whatever other kinds of social platforms are being used in today's world. And um, those digital assets are still owned by people who created those accounts. So I have a Facebook account. I'm old, so I have a Facebook account. <laughs> Um, I also have an Instagram account and a Snapchat account. I don't have TikTok. Um, I have um, a little known secret about Facebook is they have a legacy feature built into their account. Um, if someone learns of your death 
and they're not related to you and they aren't the person in that legacy role or laid out by you in that legacy role, they can tell Facebook that you're deceased and your account can be locked down. And what that means is your survivors have no access to your photos any longer. They don't have access to the information. Facebook can lock the account down if somebody chooses to do it that is not you. If you have, um, so if you go into the settings for Facebook, it does have a place for you to set up somebody as your legacy person. Um, Gmail, which is probably the most used um, email account that people have, also has a legacy feature. Um, it's, it's important. It's important to have your passwords someplace that other people have access to them, that your survivors have access to them. That information is probably more important or almost more important than your legal documents. Um, they, there, there can be havoc in social media stuff if someone else has access to it. Um, and beyond the social media, if someone gains access to your financial information, it can also be disastrous. Um, early on in the presentation, I talked about um, having dealt with survivors who aren't sure that they have enough money, that they aren't sure of their finances. Giving them just this little nugget of here's here's the account information and here's how you access it would be huge for them. Um, in about 2016, I was assisting a widow, and her her husband thought he had left everything very clean for her, very you know very easy access, all of that. She was not comfortable with the internet. She was not comfortable doing things online, and it. At one point, she just handed me a disc and said, can you just do this? Can you just find it? Well, enough time had passed that these companies had been notified of his death. And so while she had passwords, they, they no longer worked. And had she had more familiarity and had he, you know, given her some different guidance, it may have had a different outcome for her. Um, ultimately, she, she did have access and she, everything has been managed. Um, but it was really stressful for her, you know, somebody who is not, a, who is not comfortable with the internet, with, with doing things online, um, this can cause problems for them. Um, and, and on a different note, as far as um, uh, digital access, um, if something, if somebody passes away in a manner that is unknown and it is believed that maybe their phone might provide information. Um, if you aren't listed as a, a digital beneficiary, the, the, the phone company has no um, legal direction to, to provide that information to you, to provide those passwords to you. Um, and Minnesota does have some statute regarding that. Um, they call it the Revised Uniform Fiduciary Access to Digital Assets Act, and it was um, created in 2016. Um, but basically, the statute gives internet users the power to plan for the management and disposition of their digital assets in a similar way as they make plans for their tangible property. So there's a whole I have a whole section of stuff, but it's technical. <laughs> if you would like more information about it, I'd be happy to provide it to you. But basically, um, you, you can have, your document can lay out digital asset, a digital asset plan as well as your tangible personal property. Um, on that note, I think we have a few questions. This might be a good time to ask. Okay. Um, so the first one is, uh, can I insert all of my financial passwords in the Boulay vault and tell my advisor to allow my personal representative to have access to this information, including my financials? Um, um, I believe you can put your, your passwords there. You do have to 
have it in writing, who has access to that information? Um, like I said, when, when uh, um, an investment company or a bank, if they learn of your death, they're going to lock down that information. So you want to have as much stuff in writing as you can so that the person who is administering your estate has documentation that says, I have the legal right to this. And there are digital pieces that can be added to your estate planning documents. And I'm not an attorney, so I'm not going to go into that. But um, I know that there are now guides that you can have for, for, digital, for digital guidance. So we have uh, one person asking if it's a good idea to add their adult children to be joint on their financial accounts. That, that gets tricky. Um, so it depends upon what purpose you want for them to have joint or if you want the asset to transfer to them up upon death. So if you have it as a joint asset because you want them to be able to step into your shoes if there were um, if you were still alive, but they needed to step into your shoes to manage your affairs, um, that's one thing. Um, if you just wanted to transfer them to them upon your passing, you can have the account, what's called a TOD account, and the bank can help you with that, or the investment account, uh, company can help you with that. Um, there's also trust planning that can be done. So there's a variety of different things, and you should work with your advisors on that. Thank you. Um, so then you kind of mentioned the legacy options, like with social media accounts and stuff like that. Um, someone's curious, how do you get listed as a digital beneficiary? Do you have uh, more insight on that? Um, so some, um, I actually um, recently, um, within the last year, I've put together a digital guide, which is like this guide, but specific to digital assets. Um, and it got to be very clear to me that you, you kind of have to look at each of your own, um, so especially social stuff, you have to look at your own accounts. Each of them have their own rules and their own guidelines. For instance, I know Google and Facebook both have things built into settings. So if you go into the settings for whatever social media thing or whatever digital thing you have, um, they are will be things in the settings that will will talk about that. Um, if I remember, there was one that was really lengthy and really cumbersome, and I started to try and kind of lay it out for a guide, and that became very apparent that we just kind of had to list them and say go to the basically go to the the settings in those accounts. Okay, thank you. Um... Is there any additional information? You had one. You had one that was asked a while ago about gifts. Or something. Sure. Yeah. Um, they kind of just are curious what a gift tax return is, the form seven hundred nine, how it uh, you know influences the state planning and things like that. Um. Uh. uh easy. Um. A gift tax return is. Um, from just a just a high level look at it, it's a, a return that's required if you make gifts to any one individual in excess of fifteen thousand. Right now, in excess of fifteen thousand dollars a year. Um, so, gift tax returns are for individuals, not couples. So, if I, for instance, were to give my my stepdaughter an $18,000 gift this year, I would have to file a gift tax return and all that's doing is telling the IRS that I have utilized some of my lifetime exemption. Um, so that's one reason you file a gift tax return. The second reason is, is if you're married, and again, in my example, if I give my stepdaughter $18,000 out of my own assets and that are just in my name, I can file a gift tax return to, to split those assets with my husband, and then instead of utilizing some of my lifetime exemption, it would be as if he had given her nine thousand and I had given her nine thousand. 
Does that answer? You. I believe so. Yep. Um, right. um, thanks for I, the insight. I, yeah, we're, we are at 12. I'm, I'm happy to stay on and answer more if anybody has any other questions. I wanna thank everybody for joining me today. Um, again, we are doing um, follow-up more in-depth looks at um, different parts of the guide. So in December, uh, I'm going to do a half an hour, I'm gonna have a half an hour recorded webinar in December that will talk to you specifically about legacy letters and, and what they can look like and give more in-depth guidance about that. I will be on at the, at the appointed time and I don't remember what day it is and it's, it's mid-December. Um, I will be on doing the chat like Graham has been doing for me today. Uh, it will be a recorded video and I will be there to answer questions as, uh, along the way as people are going through that process. So it will give you some time to think about your legacy, what you want that to look like. And um, I'm just gonna give you some pointers on, I think someone asked on how to ask the questions, but also how to maybe write out, when you do ask those questions, how do you write out those answers? So thank you everyone.